Dear family in the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ, please join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, so often it is our intent to seek revenge instead of seeking forgiveness. Help us each day instead to turn to the forgiveness that you have shown us on the cross, that great forgiveness that you have shown us that is greater than uh, that any forgiveness we could show the world. Lord, may we live with forgiving spirits as those people who have been forgiven, one people in your name. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, there's a saying, revenge is sweet. Revenge is sweet, so it seems, or so the world tells us. There's a story I'd like to share with you that's circulated uh, not only through the United States, through Canada, but even Great Britain. And, and whether or not it's true, I won't claim that it is now, but it does bring out a very moral tru- or immoral truth of our society. There was this trucker who was making a long-distance haul. He was traveling across the country, and as he was stopping one evening at midnight about, uh, he stopped into a diner to take a little break to get a cup of coffee and to have some breakfast so that he could go on with the rest of his journey for that evening. As he sat down, the diner was quiet. There was no one else in there except for the waitress who served him, brought his meal out quickly. As he sat there, though, three bikers pulled up outside. You could hear them as it was so quiet. And they came inside, and they were looking to start a fight. They came in there swaggering, and they came in there ready to, to taunt him. And they started picking a fight with him, trying to taunt him. Well, this trucker driver, he just sat there. He ate his meal. He ignored them. They continued to taunt him. One of the obnoxious bikers swaggered up to him and he poured his coffee over his eggs and he said, I guess you're not so big and tough without your truck. Really hoping to get this truck driver's goat here. The truck driver still sat there quietly. He ate the potatoes that were still dry and he put his tip on the table, paid the waitress and left. Well, those three bikers, they looked at the waitress and they kind of sneered at one of another and at her and said, well, I guess he wasn't much of a man, was he? The waitress looked at them and said, well, I I guess not. Then she looked out the window and she said, well, I guess he wasn't much of a driver either. He just ran over three motorcycles. If you understand what, and I think you do, what was being said there, you see that a truth of our society, whether or not the story was true, it brings out a truth in many of us. We, well... We think that revenge is sweet. How many of you were sitting there thinking that the bike, how sorry you were for the bikers just now? How many of you were thinking they got what they deserved? How true is it in our lives that we find revenge to be this sweet thing that we seek after? Some of you, you have children and grandchildren who play sports. How many of you, when you've seen them get fouled and taken advantage of in a game, then, that you don't think, I hope they get justice. They hope they get what is coming to them. How many of you, when you saw Osama bin Laden captured and put to death, mourned for his eternal soul, because at least by his outward actions, we don't think he was going to heaven. How many of you sat there, though, and instead celebrated his death? How many of you, if you've heard that Ariel Castro, the man who took those three women captive and held them for years, if you heard that he has committed suicide, mourned for his suicide, his mental disabilities, So often it's much easier for us to seek revenge. It seems to be part of our our nature, our sinful human nature. We want to see justice served, or at least justice as we see it. And oftentimes when we don't see justice, at least how we perceive it, we think things are unfair. And so we seek to get that justice ourselves. We look for ways to respond to people who have hurt us. How many of you, when you've been cheated, what is your first response? Do you respond and forgive that person? Or do you immediately want to lash out? Or when you've been hurt? When someone has hurt you? And I'm not just talking about someone just stepped on your toe. I'm talking about someone who's emotionally hurt you, who's really caused you pain. What is your response to them? You want to lash out. You want to get back at them. And you want to show them that they're not going to hurt you again and that you are stronger and that you have a greater sense of pride. And Oh, wait, that sounds like something that sometimes our kids pick up from us as well. Well, don't let someone walk all over you. Don't let someone step on you. If they start a fight with you, you better make sure you win the fight. Now, I don't think any of you would have said that, but there are parents who say that. It's prevalent in our society. There's even a show right now called Revenge where the main character is celebrated because she is getting revenge for what, she, what has happened to her family and to her. Now, revenge is a very real part of our lives. And as much as we know that it is sin, it's something that is there in us. It's something that is part of us. 
And why not? Some of you have been hurt in ways that I can't imagine. People have done nasty things to you that you wouldn't even repeat out loud that you haven't even told your spouse about. Some of you, you've been hurt by things that people have said or done to you that no matter how hard you try to forget it, no matter how many times you close your eyes and try to squeeze out the memories, they still stick there. They tear at your heart, leaving you feeling like only part of the person you were, stripping you of the trust that you once had. So how, how can we not want to get revenge? How can revenge not seem like such a sweet thing then to at least somehow get back at those people who have hurt us, to somehow nail it to them and show them. And, and then we get a text like Paul's word to us in Romans today. I encourage, encourage you to turn there, but it's Romans chapter 12. It says right in verse 17, Don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends. Believe room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, say, says the Lord. Or vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, if you remember the, old, the, the King James Version. But so often it's hard to hear that. We want a sense of justice. We want a sense of God getting them back for us. We want them to be paid back as they deserve. Or so we think. There's a sense of this idea of karma among Christians. Now, karma is a very Hindu, actually, belief. But it's this idea that, and we won't get into the theology here, but it's the idea that if someone does something good, then good should come back to them. If someone does something bad, then bad will come back to them. And we see this all the time in our Christian, our Christian faith as well. We want people to, who do good to us. We want, we're okay if something nice happens to them. But if they do bad to us, we want to see them punished by God. We want to see justice served. And it's so hard to let go of those feelings. It is so hard to not seek revenge. It seems like it's the only thing we have to turn to. The problem is, is even as the world promises that revenge is sweet, it's really not, is it? Any of you who have ever sought revenge before, you know that maybe there's a short time where peace is in your heart, probably not peace, but at least a sense of victory, justice, but that feeling doesn't last. That feeling doesn't stay. Instead, it turns to bitterness too quickly. Revenge, it erodes our relationships with others. It destroys our relationship with God. It doesn't bring about joy in our lives, but only hurt and pain. When we hold grudges, when we refuse to let go, when we hold this against people, it's like an anchor weighing us down, holding us back from true joy and peace in this life but ultimately it destroys that relationship between us and God. We don't always realize it, but truly, that revenge, it comes from one place, and that is a lack of faith. Revenge comes from a lack of faith because we don't believe God will act on our behalf, that he will care for us as he's promised, but instead that we have to somehow make sure justice is served. That lack of faith it is truly destructive. So often we try to justify it too. We say, that person had it coming. Well, I certainly didn't hurt them the way they hurt me. We justify ourselves by saying, well, other people will do the same thing. Or even worse, the one that we do most often probably is, well, I'm a sinner anyway, so what's one more sin? God forgives all sins, right? Although ironically, right at the end there, or right before that, Paul says to us that, uh, shall, shall we continue sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. No, that's just justification for sin. When we justify our revenge, when we justify our seeking of grudges and bitterness, it's justifying sin. And then we cannot truly see the gift of forgiveness. See, that's the greatest trial that comes with revenge is we can't truly understand God's forgiveness. Because until we forgive, we can't understand what it means to say that God forgives us. We can't understand those words that God says to us, I forgive you, because we are so caught up in our lives, in, in our emotions, in our hurt, that we can't see just what it means when God says he forgives you. 
God never sought revenge on you. And how many times have you broken His law? God has never sought revenge on you. And how many times have you dragged His love through the mud and stomped on His heart? God has never gotten revenge on you. And how many times have you ignored His promises and tried to do it on your own and ignored your faith? That's not how God operates, though. Even though He would be the one who would be able to, only one to justly get revenge, He doesn't. Instead, He shows us love and instead He invites us back. Instead, time and again, He makes a payment for us. He doesn't make excuses, but makes a payment for us through His Son on the cross, through Jesus' death on the cross. He gave everything. He said, I am willing to show you my love and do anything so that you might know my forgiveness. Because that is exactly what he did. On the cross, he showed you that great gift of forgiveness, and he set you free from your sin. He didn't ignore your sin. He didn't pretend it wasn't there. But he did set you free of your sin by setting you free of your sin because he made the payment in full by his own precious blood on the cross. He made the payment in full so that you would be free to live as a child of the light. And as a child of the light, we have been given the blessing of setting others free as well. Because truly, that is what forgiveness does. It not only sets others free, but it sets us free. When we set others, when we forgive others, it is showing them God's love and grace, and we are freeing them. We're not excusing them. We're not saying what they did was okay. We're not even pretending that the hurt is gone in our hearts. But what we are doing is we are saying, we're not going to carry around that baggage with us any longer. We're not going to carry around what they've done to us. But we are going to turn it over to God at the cross and we are going to cast our burdens onto Him. And He will exchange those with light burdens and an easy yoke. And He will set us free. Now I know that some of you have been hurt badly and I don't mean to undermine that in any way. But the longer you hold on to that revenge, the longer you hold on to that hurt, that grudge, the more it worms its way into your heart. The more it finds a place that it stays there, separating you from others and separating you from God. So as you think about those people who have hurt you, those people who have cheated you, those people who have offended you, those people who have been unjust to you, I encourage you to think about them now and think about how God asked you to forgive them. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? It's not something that we can sit here and say, yeah, I'm going to do that right now. As God forgives us and it seems so easy, it certainly wasn't, was it? It cost him everything. Sometimes when we forgive others, it's not a momentary thing. It's not something we do one, one time a day. But so many times when someone has truly hurt us, it takes time and time again. Again, going before the Lord and praying for His strength to forgive them. Again, going before the Lord and saying, Lord, please remove these feelings of anger and hurt from my heart so that I can forgive this other person. Lord, please lift this baggage from me. And I know that some of you need to pray those prayers. I know that some of you need to lift up those prayers because as long as you hold on to that, it's hurting you. It's locking you up. It's keeping you from experiencing the full freedom of the gospel. True joy and peace in God. True joy comes in knowing that we have been forgiven and showing that forgiveness to others. That forgiveness is a center of our faith and that forgiveness is a center of our relationship with others. Now some, some, some of you folks have told me that you've troubled, you have trouble with the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. You struggle with those words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You don't have to raise your hands, but does anybody have a problem praying those at times, those words at times? Well, those words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, are meant as a reminder. They're meant as a reminder that it is not about us. As often as we forgive, it's not meant, it's not about that. It's not about how well we've lived, but our forgiveness is always about God's word to us on the cross. I forgive you. And so when we pray that prayer, it's a reminder it's a reminder of the great gift God has given to us and a great gift that we have to share with others. And that when we share that gift, others too will know God's forgiveness. Others too will know that great gift that he's shown to us. It's not easy. 
Certainly not. Revenge has become part of our human nature, our sinful human nature. It's become ingrained in us in what we watch on TV, what we see in our society. But there's only one way to overcome it. And as Paul tells us, to overcome evil, we must overcome it with evil. Over, Freudian slip there, overcome evil with good. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. The only way we can truly overcome revenge, the pain and hurt in our lives, is to turn it over to God at the cross. Trust that he will not only care for us, but he will take care of those who harm us. Trust that not only will he take care of us, but he will take care of others as well. And he will make sure, he will make sure that justice is served. Not our sinful skewed view of justice, but his perfect view of justice. So I encourage you as you go out to overcome evil in this world, in your families, in your homes, with God's good. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, so often in our lives, revenge is so easy to seek. Grudges are easy to hold. Forgiveness comes so difficultly. Remind us of your forgiveness. Remind us each day of the ways that you have forgiven us and the ways that you have taken away our sins. Remind us of the ways in which you have set us free so that we might live as your people. Forgive us for those times when we are unwilling to forgive. Forgive us for those times when we hurt others, when we are unwilling to let go. Forgive us and remind us that your forgiveness is not dependent on what we do, but it's, on, but it's on who we are, because we are your sons and daughters, who you have made your very own in holy baptism. May you each and every day lead us to seek your love, to overcome evil with good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.